Looks like we've got a quorum, so we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, my name is Reinhardt Quelly. Um, uh, my Starbucks name is Ryan, um, so when I order food, but, uh, but Reinhardt's not so bad. So uh, I'm uh, with the Cisco WebEx group, um, and uh, this is a, an update that we uh, proposed basically a number of years ago. We, uh, we gave our user story about as we just kicked off the OpenStack project, and so uh, and so um, we'll talk a little bit of update of where we are, what we've done, um, and what we're what we're working on these days. So um, we'll go through a little bit of history of, of where we kind of the, the sequence that we went through over the years. Um, I'll talk a little bit about um, our organization. We actually changed our organization up um, quite a bit in order to uh, deliver the, the in the manner that we'll I'll be talking about here. And that's actually a theme that I that I run into a lot uh, as I talk to kind of my peers um, at this organ at this meetup um, or at this uh, conference as well as other meetups. I'll talk about pl my platform team and what that platform means, uh, how we deliver what we do, and what the components of that are. Um, talk a little bit, uh, a couple of slides on on our multi-cloud strategy, and kind of uh, you'll see as we go through that we do we do deploy to multiple clouds, and we'll describe that. Um, spend a little bit of time on saying how we how we deploy applications, kind of what our what our what our methodology is, and what the tool sets we use are. Um, it'll be necessarily fairly fairly brief and and scan you know, touch the uh, touch the high points. And I happy to talk over the next couple of days if anybody wants to look me up and talk about details of these things. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, let's go ahead and jump right into it. So we actually started our OpenStack journey in uh, in October of 2011. It was actually the uh, the Essex Design Summit back in Boston. Uh, we, my uh, chief architect at the time, uh, we had just acquired another company uh, that has previously been deploying to Amazon. And the, uh, the task at hand was to get some infrastructure up underneath them in our own WebEx data centers so that they could continue delivering the way that they were used to delivering in Amazon. And so we kicked off our OpenStack project. By, by July of that year, we had, uh, we had stood up an OpenStack uh, environment underneath them. Uh, and uh, and we uh, we went launched a private beta at that time. All this time we haven't actually weren't talking about the the product that we were launching and what we were doing on top of that. We were fairly uh, cagey about that because we being, being a big public company we don't like to pre-announce what we're doing. Um, <clears throat> that'll come up a little bit later. Um, but in spring of 2013, um, after after an extended beta of that that application, we launched two new initiatives within Cisco right about the same time. The first was a brand new, um, we had made the statement back in, back in July of, of, of 12 that, that we were targeting all future development, um, kind of all major net new applications to the OpenStack environment. Um, <clears throat> and so come, uh, come spring, we actually did launch a new application project. And that was, again, um, as we had promised, uh, delivered and, and targeted specifically for OpenStack. Um, we also, at that time, kicked off a Cisco-wide OpenStack environment. So a lot of the team that you see here within Cisco is, a, is an internal um, team called Cloud Infrastructure Services. We're on a platform called CCS. And so right about that time, we were launching both of those projects. Um, <clears throat> and then spring of this year, we actually finally launched our uh, the, did the uh, public release of the application that we've been building on OpenStack. So today, you can go, go to this, uh, go to that URL and, and download and run the uh, Cisco Spark, which is a new collaboration application in the WebEx family. Um, it is 100% hosted on OpenStack. Uh, so from media bridges to backend data stores to monitoring and metrics to everything else, runs 100% on OpenStack. And so, um, so I finally finally get to talk about what we've actually been working to deploy all this time. But that so that's fairly exciting. So uh, this project was interesting. Um, <clears throat> one of the challenges as we as we deployed OpenStack within WebEx, there was a lot of inertia, a lot of existing processes, a lot of um, muscle memory on how you build applications, how you work with engineering, how you roll, how you do change control, all this stuff, all of which made it uh, difficult to iterate and move very, very quickly. So the management team, uh, our new CTO and C, um, uh, Group VM at the time, basically had us all working together in a, a room through an architecture session. They called us into the room and, f and fired us all, said, everybody walk out the door. OK, you're all rehired. Let's start a new startup inside of, inside of Cisco that will be concentrated on building this application. And so that, that project was launched. We actually moved an operations team, an application development team, and client development team all into one organization and did a, a true DevOps style startup with, with those teams jointly deploying and running to that application. This is a huge part of our ability to get this, to get this project out and running, running quickly and, and building what we'll describe later as this cloud native application. 
So um, after incubation, after we went into beta, um, we actually have, have started rejoining the Cisco, the WebEx mothership, and you'll find us uh, combining operations and combining, combining other things uh, as we move forward, as we integrate with the rest of the, of the WebEx properties. So um, my job in platform engineering, so I run, in the, of those groups, the cloud apps engineering, the client engineering, and the platform engineering, I'm responsible for the platform side, and I always joke that this is my job. My job at the platform level is to be invisible. I, I shouldn't be seen. It's kind of like the kids, you know, better seen um, but not heard. Um, in general, people just want me to, to be under the covers and, and not see what's going on. So I strive to be, I strive to be boring. In fact, one of our, our top, uh, our, if we do a Kanban style um, uh, thing, and our, our, top, our top priority is always what we call quest for boring. Um, try, try to be boring, so that's, that's a theme here. So my team is responsible for the build release environment. So we do uh, so all of the um, the build test uh, environment runs is managed by my team. Uh, <coughs> running the deployment targets, you know where we actually deploy the applications to. I'll talk about that a lot uh, coming up in a couple of slides. Common services, uh, message buses, um, data services like uh, well message buses like RabbitMQ, data services like Cassandra, uh, React, um, uh, Redis, uh, Postgres, a variety of other things. Um, the, <clears throat> we're also responsible for the service assurance layer. How do I monitor, manage, make sure all this stuff is still running? Um, and as I mentioned before, we are a joint engineering team. We fall under our engineering organization, and so all of my operations people are, in fact, software engineers um, building operations as a software project. Um, and so a lot of the stuff that you see will be around this. I don't have a traditional operations team. It's all. It's all engineers and the software that the engineers are writing in order to deliver this stuff. So um, another way of saying this is that the green, if the green stuff is the things that my cloud application teams are providing, and the gray stuff at the bottom, well, I guess there's two grays. Um, the gray stuff at the bottom uh, is what my infrastructure provider delivers to me on that layer in between. So all the things that, that support the applications that we run. So um, and I mentioned most of those things. In particular, I'll talk um, a little bit later about uh, a significant number of our applications actually deploy to a PaaS. Um, we use Cloud Foundry, and I'll talk about kind of when we deploy to the PaaS and when we don't. So, um, we do today deploy across five data centers and four data center providers. Um, all of them are OpenStack. You'll find that. Um, that we run uh, paired primary data centers where data is actually replicated across those two data centers. We have uh, particularly high sensitivity things that are running in um, exclusively in Cisco data centers, things like the key management servers that, that manage the keys for the end-to-end -end encryption that we use in our application. Those run 100% in Cisco data centers. We also have command and control that, that uh, we, 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 we treat, uh, you know, I put a diode for the electrical engineers in the room. Everything in our environment, uh, command and control, pushes into our cloud providers. We, we don't really trust our cloud providers. Um, everything, all of our key material, everything that we're doing is, is pushed into the environment. And that just makes a, a lot of conversations a lot easier with InfoSec teams, with corporate policy folks, uh, et cetera. So, um, but we do run, uh, we done, on the right-hand side there, you'll, you, we do run, we do run a, a number of public providers as well as the Cisco-operated um, internal OpenStack providers. We have primary data centers where we run the full stack. Um, uh, uh, Spark is primarily a, a, a messaging. Um, there, there's a rooms metaphor. It's kind of like a chat rooms with, uh, with integrated video conferencing and a number of other things in there, file sharing. All the data services are distributed across those two primary data centers. But we do have, in addition to the key management servers I talked about, we do have media bridges um, that, that consume a lot of bandwidth. We need a lot of them. And those in particular, we split out to additional data centers in addition to the primary data centers. And so those are the ones that spread around the world to get close to customers effectively. Um, and so uh, you'll find uh, we'll ha you'll find we have more of those in external data centers than our own, simply for reach. So uh, why OpenStack Cloud? You know, I'm actually not going to talk about this. Um, we're all here at an OpenStack conference. We kind of understand why we why we develop for cloud and and why OpenStack is a solid choice for doing that. So I'm going to assume that you guys know why we're targeting cloud and why we're doing OpenStack. Um, it is interesting that we, uh, we do leverage public cloud, even though we have our own OpenStack providers, our own Cisco managed OpenStack providers. There's a couple reasons for that. One of the reasons was pure timing. When we launched the project, 
the Cisco wide OpenStack, internal OpenStack built for the Cisco SaaS properties was launched at the same time. So it simply wasn't ready for us. If we wanted to start our deployment pipelines and start building the application and doing continuous delivery, which we literally did from within two weeks after launching the project, we started the delivery pipeline and we haven't stopped since. Well, that had to be done in a place well, the cloud was there, and so the, uh, the the internal stuff came a little bit later. So that was the first thing was actually to leverage that pride provider that was already available. Um, the second thing is that we are mobile first. So our application, so so Cisco Spark is a mobile first application. And the funny things about these mobile devices is they don't come to us over the corporate network most of the time. They come over our cell providers' networks. And so they actually, you know, their connections that are coming to us, you know, we, as we're doing development, we don't want to bring up a VPN every time we want to connect to the, to the, to the back-end servers. And so, so for that reason also, all of our, from day one, all of our developer systems had to be outside of the corporate firewall and, and accessible from these mobile devices that we're doing that are our primary targets for our application. Um, and the final thing was uh, fast capacity on demand. Um, I don't know of any, well, maybe, uh, maybe eBay and, uh, and Walmart by the numbers uh, now, but, but none of these guys, none of, most of the private um, OpenStack environments are actually much smaller than what we can have available in, in, um, in the public cloud right now. So being able to, take, to leverage that capacity without the lead times and the, and the uh, capacity planning and everything is, is very, very handy to be able to have that. Uh, in general, people talk about cloud bursting. This is a form of cloud bursting, being able to use those resources wherever they are and whoever, whoever has them. So, um, We do have, uh, as I mentioned, now that, we're in, now that we're in production, we continue to leverage public, public and private. Um, in general, being able to carry our base loads on our own infrastructure makes a lot of sense. Um, we have specific, a, a number of specific network access requirements. Um, so my build environment, like all, like all uh, well, like most DevOps teams, you want to have your build environment, your dev environments look as much like production as possible. But I do have things like source code and um, uh, build systems and, and secret stores and various other things. It's very, very handy to have that within the corporate walls. Yet, it's still OpenStack. It still looks like the rest of our deployments from a deployment management perspective. And so we do have that. Uh, uh, the WebEx team continues to have an OpenStack environment. And there's, as we do closer integration between Cisco Spark and WebEx, there's things that I would like to run in the WebEx data center adjacent to the things that it needs to talk to. So we'll continue to use things that have those, those network access. Um, Clear delineation of access this is primarily a, a religious and, and, and uh, political um, uh, layer, but uh, there's a lot of conversations that we have when deploying to the cloud as a corporate entity deploying applications to the cloud. It just makes it a, a to be able to tell my security teams, well, the key material is always in Cisco property, or you know, the only thing that's ever in the public cloud is encrypted data. Um, that just makes conversations a whole lot easier. And so just to be able to say, look, I'm going to run these false small footprint things inside the Cisco operate things, just it's like it's a conversation I don't have to have with, with the InfoSec teams. And so that's, uh, that's very, very convenient. Uh, public cloud does continue to have, have uh, benefits. Time to market, I mentioned before. Um, uh, scale. There's, uh, there are, you know, your, your, your average public provider has a lot more capacity than your average public or private provider, and so being able to leverage that. Geographic reach. Um, you know, even Cisco, a large global company, um, doesn't have data centers in every region of the world. Um, but there are OpenStack providers in nearly every region of the world, and I can get at any of them to put these media bridges or these other things. Um, and that becomes really important when we talk about specific privacy concerns in specific regions of the world. We call it the Snowden effect, right? It's like nobody wants their data transiting through the US for a lot of these applications. We're, we're talking, so, so being able to actually ensure that those are always out there is nice. Um, and then diversity. Uh, diversity is really, really interesting and important. Uh, you know, there, is, uh, there are things that my local providers don't have yet. Uh, uh, metal as a service or ironic, for example. Uh, GPU instances, for example. Um, and so these things are available in some of these third party. And so being able to say, OK, what would my media bridge look like if I ran it on metal versus uh, running on virtual um, and those types of things. So that's a, that's a big benefit. Um, just to touch a little bit more on scale, um, being having availability of machines is one aspect of this. The second one that's really uh, um, has really been hitting home over the last year um, is minimizing the impact of failure. You know, if you have a if you have a in an Amazon scale data center where they have tens of thousands of or you know roughly ten thousand nodes per availability zone is what's been reported, four zones per region. If you have a physical failure in that type of environment. 
the chances of it actually affecting you are very, very small. And if it does affect you, it's going to affect one of your machines. Well, if my private provider has hundreds of physicals, and I'm running hundreds of VMs on those physicals, a single node failure in this environment is a very high chance of actually affecting multiples of my nodes. And so being able to have, be able to spread my stuff across a max, a more and more hosts is, is very, very valuable to me. Um, the second thing that's, uh, that's been interesting is that, um, is that in a private cloud, we tend to have to manage capacity more closely. We, we don't have infinite resources. We don't have an infinite number of machines, even a, even a company the size of Cisco. And so, so uh, I do have to give my internal providers an idea of how much capacity I'm going to need in the next n months. And that's, that's actually not an easy conversation to have when I've just released the product and I have no idea what I'm going to need in a couple months. And so, um, and so, that's, uh, that, so this is uh, having the scale and the ability to, to use resources elsewhere is a, is a big deal for us um, as well. So uh, um, if you get beyond kind of the technical things of, of, using, uh, uh, of uh, using multiple providers, there are some, uh, or you know, using multiple OpenStack instances, the kind of the multiple providers is actually very useful. Um, so the first thing here is, is uh, the policy conversations I talked about before, where we can choose one, one provider that has a particular set of policies, a particular deployment, you know, the, the German provider who doesn't have data centers outside of Germany, so I can ensure that German citizens' data never lose Germany, or my key management servers that are run by a particular, particular vendor, i.e. Cisco and our stuff. Um, and so that just makes those policy decisions all that much easier. Um, you know, there, there's been a number of stories. Certainly, the uh, the code spaces um, going out of business in 2014 when they lost control of their access, their uh, Amazon keys. Um, now there were, were ways they could have mitigated that, but but the bottom line is when you when you're if all of your stuff is in one place and you have a set of powerful keys that control that one place, the blast radius is very very high if you if you make a mistake there. Um, yet, if I'm, if I'm going across multiple providers and multiple data centers, the blast radius for any particular mistake is contained. It's in that, it's in that little area. So we do, like that, we do like that separation. Changes in commercial terms. Um, I don't know if anybody got a pager duty bill lately, but pager duty is about to jump our, our, our pager duty bills. Not an OpenStack provider, of course, but, uh, but we got a bunch of automation tied into pager duty. And this, it's renegotiating that contract is going to be painful um, because I can't easily move somewhere else. And so having multiple providers for commercial reasons is, is very valuable. Um, the, uh, this diversity of uh, implementations, this, I wrote this slide a while back. Um, I don't know if you guys remember the XSA 108 Zen exploit where we had to go reboot all of our hosts. Um, because of the uh, because of the hypervisor exploit in Zen, um, that was kind of a non-event for us because our our Cisco providers all use KVM and our public providers use Zen, and so we just failed over to our Cisco data centers and slept through the weekend. Um, well, that was all fun until this weekend, um, <laughs> where Venom got both of them. Um, but uh, yeah, sometimes it doesn't always work that way. But but we have a better chance of of weathering through something like that. So. Um, there are disadvantages, of course. Uh, as we go across, there's, there's more complexity as we go across providers. Some of the obvious things, uh, instance types are all named differently. They're sized differently, having to manage that. Uh, the public IP mechanisms differ from OpenStack provider to OpenStack provider. Some do provider networks, some do floating IPs, and having to manage and make our puppet configuration manage multiple providers um, is a pain, um, very large pain. Uh, security, uh, security group implementations can be different across providers. Um, Sometimes not provided at all, a sore point. Um, and so some of these differences, it does, it does take work um, today. Um, you know, as we look at the common core stuff and being able to have some rationalization about what an OpenStack provider does um, will be good um, because it will help minimize these things. Uh, it actually is costly in Cisco to onboard a new vendor. Whole process, whole financial, you know, this uh, internal you know, business continuity plans, privacy agreements, all this stuff. It takes time to, time to onboard another vendor. So it's not free to onboard another vendor. Sometimes, sometimes that gets in our way. Always that gets in our way. Um, actually, um, 
this uh, uh, provider processes being different is rather interesting. If you look at the way that the, the, our internal provider handled the, the Venom announcement and reboots and everything else, it was quite different than the way our external providers did. And having to manage two different vendors with two different processes can be, can be challenging just because we're building operational processes around these things, right? It's like when I get a notice that says this, I react in this way. And if I'm getting different notices in different ways across different providers, it can be challenging. So um, some of these things, the Cisco InterCloud, which I won't talk about at all here, but there's other things going on in the sessions that you can see um, solves for some of these things, where, where, this, uh, where the cloud of clouds on, with Cisco and partners actually, actually can, kind of smooths some of these things, including um, so, uh, so you can follow up with the rest of the Cisco folks about that. So let's go back to our deployment for a minute um, and kind of discuss about uh, kind of out of the, you know, why we do cloud. Well, we're all doing cloud today, so I won't talk, didn't talk about that. Multi-provider, that was important to us. But let's, let's talk about what we're actually deploying and where we're deploying and how we're deploying it. So, so we'll talk about, about these things in general. So again, I, I'm responsible for that middle layer, and we're deploying these applications on top of that. One thing I will double click in just briefly here, um, deploying a, what we call a platform, which is the thing that our software, the applications that we're building, runs on, is um, uh, there, there's obvious things like the database services and, and the, the PaaS itself that we're deploying to, but we also have to do the service assurance layer. In general, because we're going from cloud to cloud to cloud, we bring all of this stuff with us. We deploy our own logging infrastructure, our own metrics infrastructure, our own uh, alert infrastructure, all of which so we can just pick up and carry and, and drop into whatever environment, and therefore I, I, I have commonality across those. And I don't generally consume those things from, uh, from my providers in these cases. Now I do, there are a couple services like DNS, for example, that's a third party external service that I consume. There are some of these things that I, uh, New Relic, which most people are probably familiar with, I consume as a, as a third party service. The stuff in the blue are things that I, I consume from others. But most of the service assurance stack I, I carry with me. That's about all I'll say about that. I have de gory detailed slides of how we do service assurance, but I won't bore you with them. Eric, I'll bore with you with them later. Um, but uh, so, uh, big part of de deciding what we're going to deploy. If I look at this thing here, you'll see things that are deploying uh, to the PaaS, and you'll see things that are deploying straight to the IaaS. And the question is, how do we make the decision? You know, what, 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 what do we target where? So the first thing as a platform is I have to be able to support all of these things because I have. I have applications in different parts of their life cycle, different types of applications, things that have data, um, persistent data, things that don't. And so as a platform, I, I need to support all of them. But in general, we target everything we possibly can at the PaaS. It deals with a bunch of the plumbing. It deals with deployment. It deals with scaling. It de deals with uh, HTTP routing. There's a bunch of things that it, that it will take for, care of for us if we just let you know, deploy the application into that environment. Um, However, it's best for HTTP routed, um, single port, stateless applications. Um, for things that have persistent message stores, like my data services, um, the, they, they don't fit very well in the, in the paths. And so we target those straight at the, um, at, the, at the hardware. The most notable example of this in our world is our media bridges. Um, I can't just turn off a media bridge when I do a scaling event. I, I have to wait for the, for the messages or the, the meetings that are on that bridge to bleed off before I can switch, switch it out for another one. So managing the life cycle of that application is different. Um, there's the media bridges open up um, a thousand ports that they're listening on. Um, that doesn't route through a Cloud Foundry router particularly well. So, I, I just, uh, so those types of applications I just deploy straight to the, to the bare metal. And then, of course, our, our, our IaaS hosted services, our, our, our Cassandras, our Rabbit MQs, our, you know, anything that has persistent disk, that has long running state, that I'm not, spending a, I'm not spending a new release of Cassandra every 20 minutes like I am with my applications. But uh, so these things that are long running, we target, again, straight to the IaaS. I don't actually have any metal in my world. Everything is, everything's virtual and consumed through my OpenStack provider, with the exception of the, uh, the metal as a service, which we'll be experimenting with for, for media bridges. So we do choose kind of the right deployment model for the right application, and we support our kind of platform supports all of those, and we pick which one. We steer the user to the one that makes sense for them. Now, if I do go in that middle layer, I as hosted apps, there's a whole bunch of plumbing that that, that engineering team has to write for themselves. Um, you know, quiescing applications, um, um, uh, uh, start and stop, all, uh, health check, all of this stuff has to be done by that application team. They can't rely on the, the, the paths to provide it for them. So. Um, just a brief, uh, a brief foray into into our applications. Uh, I mentioned that this was a this was a new project, a new application, and we are targeting 
we are um, cooperating with talking about building cloud native applications with our engineering teams. These things are being built to run in the, in the cloud as a cloud application. Uh, it is a microservices architecture. A couple of the top bullet points are here, but there's, you know, if you read the 12 factor app um, thing that was mentioned earlier, there's a lot, of, lot that goes into building a stateless um, cloud native application. And we do, we do push everything we can into that direction. Um, but it also is true that, that it's not just the things that we build. Um, and run our environment that should be cloud native. We, we try to, in every case, pick a cloud native version of the data services that we're using. Cassandra is a great example of this, where it's a scale out horizontal thing. You run a cluster, set your application value of three. I don't really care if one of them goes away. Um, but it does have persistent data. And it manages persistence and availability at the application layer. And that's what we're doing at our application as well. Which kind of brings us into the next slide, which is primarily Availability is, in every case in our world, an application layer concern. I don't expect my infrastructure to provide any particular availability for me. That's an application problem to provide that availability. This is kind of one of the key differences between kind of your traditional enterprise app and your traditional cloud app is that, is that this is delegated to the applications, which means it's a partnership with our application teams that are building these things to build, the, to build this in this way. Um, we prefer lots of small nodes um, rather than a few big nodes. Um, Lots of good reasons for that, one of which is that's generally what's available in cloud infrastructure is more small nodes. Um, but also, if, uh, the, if you have, you know, in the case of my current Elasticsearch cluster in this one application, I've got 30 machines in the cluster, uh, 26 machines in the cluster, I guess. Uh, if I lose any one of those, meh, it was a 26th of my capacity, um, and I have three-way replication anyway. If that was a, if that was a, 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 a Postgres pair, master-slave pair, for example, and I lost one of those nodes, I've just lost all my read slaves, and it's like I'm at 50% capacity like that. And that's really evil. Um, so, so being able to have lots of little things just is, is a happier place to run, let's say. Um, so uh, um, how am I doing on time? Wow, I need to talk faster. Um, and you thought I was talking fast already. Um, so uh, so uh, we, we do prefer local storage. Um, for these Cassandra nodes, for example, have local storage on them. We tend to avoid block storage. Um, it's more resilient. It's faster. Um, and the application's taking care of its uh, availability anyway. Um, we are explicitly building our applications multi-data center. Um, when, you, when you start up your app, it, it, it talks to a discovery service and figures out which data center to talk to, and we switch in the app from data center to data center. I don't do any fancy networking to, to deliver traffic to one data center or the other. That's an application concern, um, much like mail uh, or SIP if you're in the SIP world. It's like these things are built into the applications to understand multiple servers and priority of servers and everything else. We do that to our applications. Um, the final thing I'll say on this uh, building kind of applications is, is that because we have capacity available, effectively infinite capacity available at any time, um, it changes the way we approach certain operations. We tend to not upgrade things in place. We tend to side grade. We tend to, to stand up a new instance and flip traffic to that new instance. Uh, to expand our, or to upgrade or, or replace a Cassandra node, I stand up another node, join it to the cluster, wait for the data to replicate, turn off the old one. So I don't generally, I don't generally upgrade things in place. So um, how do I deploy all these machines? What do I do? Well, we, we, we follow um, a, a very kind of flexible, composable steps in our things. We don't, we don't say, hey, the, the VM is always, or the, the image is always the unit of deployment, and everything has to be packaged into a VM and do this. It's like VMs are built in a particular way. We start with a juice image. We apply a puppet config. We configure the application. Um, through that config largely, but, but sometimes a secondary process. Um, I don't really care. Um, well, there's a, a sentence fragment there. I don't really care whether it's bare metal or a VM or a vagrant box in dev or whatever else. The process is kind of the same, and I use this across my whole fleet, in e including even building Docker images, which I'll talk about briefly in a bit. We kind of use the same process for all of this. We do follow a masterless Puppet module, a really um, model. I talked about this at length at the Puppet Conf two years ago, about why we do masterless. It's all about timing and, and getting a particular set of configs on a particular machine and maintain that over time, because we're constantly churning our environment. So how do I manage the sequence and the life cycle of this stuff? So I won't talk about that more. You can look it up, uh, look it up on the web. Um, uh, we, do have, uh, we do use Hira um, for our configuration, pushing data in and out of Git. Um, we're actually starting to push a bunch of that into MongoDB, rather than the, the Git repos they're all in right now. Git, re Git repos are actually great. Um, carried us two years, uh, but it's hard to 
it's hard to manage across many people in a team. Um, get blame is great. You can always tell who changed what config where. So, um, but uh, but uh, getting it into a state that's referenceable by other people at any time by other automation tools is, is necessary. Uh, we do push orchestration. We uh, all of this stuff, masterless puppet, standing up these machines. We have to have something that goes out and and. Uh, you know, we take template files and we interpret those template files and push them. Remember, remember, we're running. We don't have our our data centers don't have access back into command and control. Everything in command and control is pushing everything to the data center. So we use tools like Fabric and Stackstorm to take our configurations and push them onto the existing environments. And so um, I can talk about that at some some length. Um, we do mostly immutable. I talked about side grades. We do mostly immutable our infrastructure, but we're not, we're not pedantic about it. Um, you know, if I need to delete a user from a machine, I'm sure as hell not going to rebuild the machine. I'm just going to say, you know, ensure absence and ensure absent and puppet, and he's gone. So it's much faster, a lot less churn, a lot less strain on logging and metrics and other systems to have those machines be a little more stable. Um, so. Uh, just one note, uh, I added this bullet after watching one of the other presentations this yesterday. Um, Cloud Foundry, um, the standard way of deploying Cloud Foundry is using Bosch, which is, their, which is their automation system for deploying and managing that thing. Well, Cloud Foundry is one server type, or one service of 26 that I run. It has three server types. It's really simple. I just use my standard deployment tooling to deploy, to deploy Cloud Foundry. It's actually quite simple to deploy. And that way, it's the same as everything else in my environment that I'm managing. You'll hear me talk a lot about it's the same in every environment. We strive a lot for, for, uh, for consistency here. Um, this is what it looks like uh, in general for today. Um, our infrastructure is all defined as code. Um, we have uh, configuration manifests, our puppet manifests, which are, which are compiled, actually. They're, they're checked into Jenkins. When you change one of these things, uh, um, Jenkins picks up the, 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 the change builds a new set of puppet modules and checks them into, into the yum repos or Debian repos. We use both Debian and Ubuntu. I'm sorry, uh, uh, we use Ubuntu and, uh, and CentOS. Um, we have a, we have a, a definition language. Uh, it looks a little bit like a heat template. Uh, what's different from heat is that it runs across multiple providers and multiple environments. Um, so that's why we're not using heat, is that we, we actually deploy across multiple OpenStack environments, local vagrant, and oh, by the way, a large cloud provider in, Vagrant, in uh, Redmond provides some of our some of our uh, some of our uh, infrastructure as well. Um, so uh, things like DNS, for example, Route 53, cool stuff. Um, so uh, so we do have the uh, we do have uh, you know if you take the basics of our configuration, not the high red data that says this is what this thing is supposed to look like, the puppet modules say this is how that's supposed to be applied. We package that all up. Push it onto in, to deployed hosts. Um, we're using uh, Fabric primarily for reading these manifest files and saying go instantiate this thing and push that config onto that machine. And it's Fabric that talks to the OpenStack APIs to say go build this thing or the, uh, this particular instance. Um, this is actually uh, we're right in the midst. Um, if we weren't rebooting machines because of the Venom bug, uh, we would be working on this, uh, which is introducing uh, a product called Stackstorm. It's open source. Um, they're actually here um, this week. Um, you can find them around. Um, but basically, Stackstorm is a, an execution environment for a bunch of the automation that we've already built that allows us to take all these tasks and these things that we've been building and running um, and make it callable from our other automation systems. Make, it, make you know, Stackstorm watch for a database change and go d execute something or, or react to an alert. And it's largely calling the things that we already have. A machine fails, well, I already have the tooling to go deploy a new machine. I just need someone to answer the alert and go launch that task for us. And so, um, so, you're, so we're kind of a, a good way of describing this is closing the loop um, on our automation and take the things that we used to have humans instantiating, and we now have a, a, are using Stackstorm to do that. So it's an iteration. And in fact, it's kind of a theme in a bunch of the stuff we do is kind of iterate on this, right? It's like get something working, expand it, grow it, and, and, uh, and then move on to the next thing, and sometimes go back and, and revisit some of these. And so we're, we're really big on iterations. Um, we do chat ops, actually. It's kind of um, the, way that we, the way that we interact with a bunch of our systems is, is through a chat bot. This is the top of that line there. This is actually a screen. hope it doesn't have anything embarrassing in there. The top screen basically is, uh, is uh, Nate. Uh, um, Bang server type blue uh, blah. He's he's issuing a command to chat ops to go create a new Bastion server in that particular data center. Um, Nalan, it's a it's our uh, Cisco Allen data center, um, and then chatbot goes and follows that. So anyway, pretty uh, pretty simple stuff. Well, not simple, but not hard either. Just a lot of moving parts. 
a uh, lot of buzz about containers uh, this this show and elsewhere. Uh, we, yep, we run containers. Um, in fact, since we're running Cloud Foundry, by definition, everything we're deploying is, in fact, in a container uh, because that's how Cloud Foundry does its work. Um, and uh, we do have, uh, we're running Docker as well um, for right now primarily in our build environment. Uh, some of these applications that we're building have very intricate and detailed environmental things, uh, uh, specific C libraries on the systems, um, uh, Python libraries on the systems, all these things that actually need to be uh, managed carefully for a particular build. And so the first deployment of Docker for us was in that build environment, running on our Jenkins agents to control our build environment. Well, it's a very short step between that and saying, Docker push. <laughs> and here's this built thing, now go, now go use that. And so you'll see, uh, particularly on the media bridges, uh, starting to use that for part of our deployment. Um, and then, of course, we're watching Diego and the other things that are happening. So uh, what's next for us? Um, uh, uh, we have a number of other Cisco teams within the uh, collaboration technology group that are also moving to the cloud. Um, some of them are very like-minded, building similar applications stacks. And we've, uh, we're throwing in together and saying, hey, let's, let's use a common platform rather than building a new one. Um, other applications uh, are less so. Other applications that have uh, more of an installed base um, more of a um, more of a uh, you know a different application architecture that doesn't lend itself well to the to the stack and the things that we do, um, and in many cases they're picking up pieces of our platform, our logging platform, our metric platform, our um, our alert system, and using those, but then not using kind of Cloud Foundry and Cassandra and all the other things that we use in our platform. So we're we're pretty uh, pragmatic about what we share and who picks up what, but. Um, you'll find us deploying to a lot more data centers as we expand out into the world with the application. Um, uh, both, both our own data centers, WebEx data centers, more Cisco data centers. Um, there are, uh, by my count right now, I've got about 30 different OpenStack data centers that are available to me as I, as I need to deploy into different, different areas. And so you'll find us spreading, spreading even more. Um, and then as we bring on these other guys, expanding our platform services, um, upgrading our logging infrastructure to use Kafka, for example, as a persistent uh, ring buffer in there, uh, for example. Um, adding Kafka as an application layer service. Um, a bunch of, you'll kind of find us expanding those things. So, um, so that's it. Um, I'm happy to take uh, any questions, if we have time for questions. I will ask that you use the mic, however. Well, you're kind of trapped, so I'll repeat for you. <laughs> I have a quick question regarding uh, how do you, what's your I'm strategy? Sorry, so if we can go with her for just a minute. Right. Go ahead. Uh, you talked about not using teams. Yeah. Earlier, you said that all of your public cloud providers that you use are using OpenStack. So I was a little confused why that. Well, heat, heat, heat in its current incarnations is uh, it's executed in the context of a particular provider, right? Your heat template is being interpreted in a particular OpenStack provider. And a lot of our clusters, like our Cassandra clusters, have members in two different providers across two different environments. And so my, my templates are actually saying, you know, if I look at my machine definition, it says, you know, data center one for these three machines, data center two for these three machines, and our orchestration is hitting two machines, two separate API credentials, everything to deploy. So that's the primary reason, so. So I'm just curious, what's your scaling strategy in terms of handling more applications? I'm sorry? So what's your scaling strategy? I'm just, for example, if you're, you're, ordering, you're actually offering Cassandra as a service, Kafka yeah. as a service, I mean, they're all useful in their own way, but they also suck in their own way. You have, people, you have to have people to understand how each application works, but then if you want to, order, if you want to offer a service like 100 different services, I mean, do you actually have 100 people, or what's your strategy to kind of scale up? Yeah, good, great question. Actually, this is, um, so the first thing is that, um, is that the platform team uh, we do not expect ourselves to be expert at every one of these things. Um, we, we assist with the deployment of the thing, Cassandra, for example, uh, making sure that we're deploying it, monitoring it, the basic operations are covered. But the people who are really expert at running Cassandra are in fact the application users that are consuming that. And I think in, in general, this is something across, you'll, you'll hear me, all these things I mentioned were mostly NoSQL style solutions. Um, we don't have a Cassandra team that, that, that is, knows everything about Cassandra. The, the application teams are a lot more closely tied to running, you know, running the, um, Cassandra, doing the DB reviews for Sandra, understanding how to use Cassandra. So it's a, the short answer is it's a partnership with the engineering team who's using that. Now, we do tend to push people into a particular thing, right? If I've already got Cassandra running and someone comes to me and says, hey, I would really like you to deploy React, 
I, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to ask them, you know, pretty detailed questions about why the heck they can't use Cassandra, um, and they really need React as as an example. But and sometimes the answer is they need both. But so. <laughs> the question is, how do I make React run multi-data center? And uh, yes, the uh, React requires an enterprise license to run multi-data center. Um, and and yes, I pay a multi-user, a multi an enterprise license for the limited application where we use React. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that's a that's a bit of a little question. Yes, it's it's worked. We've run we've run it for a metadata store for a specific application for a number of years. Um, I would say that uh, is React in, is Basho in the room. Uh, Cassandra, fully open source, has been every bit as reliable, um, if not more so, for us without the licensing fees. By and large, as a as an organization, we prefer to use open source, and we're happy to pay a vendor for support. And so, if you take a look at Cassandra, I've got third-party support for Cassandra, third-party support for Stackstorm, third-party support for Rabbit. But we're using the open source versions of all of those, so that we're not locked in. We don't have to get into a licensing discussion every time I open a new data center, which, as you just heard, I open lots of data centers. And so, uh, so yeah, we we prefer that, and it is a bit of a sore spot, to be honest. So. Um, I would like it to. Um, I'm paid up for another uh, 18 months, um, so it's not a my hair's on fire. I don't have much hair left anyway. Um, but uh, yeah, we would we would we we in general are trying to push people away from that. Now there are things that it that it does well, um, and that uh, you know the uh, the vector clock specifically for managing um, consistency is useful for specific applications, and that's why we're using it. So uh, we're not you know sometimes you bite the bullet, pay the money, and and solve the problem and move on. I mean, at the end of the day, we've got to deliver our application. So, anything else? They're telling me I'm out of time. So, uh, thank you for coming, and I will be around. <laughs> <laughs>